Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I have my good friend and colleague, Dr. Dara Lee Lewis. She is the co-director of the Women's Cardiovascular Group at Lown Cardiology Group. She is faculty at Harvard Medical School and a staff physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where I also work. And we are so excited to have you on the show today. And we wanted to talk about uh, heart palpitations, or I wanted to talk about heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that I see women come to me with, particularly for starting at midlife or around menopause. And so what better person to talk about this with than a bona fide women's cardiologist. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Heather. I'm thrilled to be here. I love your show. Oh, thank you. We're so excited. I'm so excited to have you on. We've been trying to plan this for a while and getting two busy physician schedules to line up is always difficult. So let's jump into it. So when someone is experiencing a, uh, what we're kind of calling palpitation or a fluttering, when they come to you, what are, how do they say that they're having, how do you know that this could be what it is? What are some of those characteristics? So it's a great question because the word palpitation can mean so many different things to so many different people. So if someone says I'm having palpitations, I ask them to describe that a little bit more. And a lot of what I hear is I feel like there's a fish flopping in my chest. I feel like a butterfly. I feel like a, my heart thumped and then stopped. I feel like it's skipping a beat. I feel like it's missing a beat. And I've heard all of these terms and more. So the term palpitation very broadly means that something feels different in the way your heart's beating. Maybe it's beating too quickly. Maybe it's beating irregular, not in a steady rhythm. Maybe it's pounding very forcefully when it shouldn't be. So all those things can be palpitations. Yeah. So how do you begin to work this up? So... It depends on what else might be going on in someone's life. And a lot of times I hear that around changes in hormone levels, palpitations might act up. And so, for example, uh, when women are pregnant and when women go through menopause or perimenopause, those would probably be the two most common times when people come to me as a cardiologist with a complaint of palpitations. And the first thing to know is, is what else is going on in your life right now? So are they pregnant? Are they going through perhaps perimenopause? Have they started on some kind of a crash diet and lost a lot of weight? Have they started a new exercise program and maybe they're not keeping up with hydration? So first to find out any other new medications that they might be on that might be causing this. Are they taking Sudafed for hay fever, which can cause palpitations? So if all those things kind of come out and there's nothing obvious causing this, then we look at perhaps the hormone fluctuations could be a potential cause of the palpitation. But the first thing is take a really careful history about what else has led up to this. And a lot of people will say, you know, I've had this all my life as sort of a now and then thing. And now all of a sudden in the last few weeks or few months, it's all the time and it's driving me crazy. Yeah. Okay. That's actually really great. There are so many of those I didn't think about like hydration or crash diets or certainly Sudafed. So even just over the counter things that you could be taking. So then after getting the history, what kind of imaging do you do, you do or do you not do? Or lab work do you do or do you not do? Right. So it depends. And there might be something to drive you towards a particular test. For example, not commonly, but say somebody has unexpectedly lost a bunch of weight and they feel very jittery and their hair has started falling out. I might think about a thyroid problem, hyperthyroidism. And then the first thing I would do is check their thyroid levels, which is a quick blood test and examine their thyroid in the neck. But typically the more common scenario would be, huh, could be a lot of things. I'm not really sure. Let me check basic blood work. So I would check electrolytes. So primarily potassium, maybe magnesium. I would check blood work for something called anemia, which would be if the blood levels, the red blood cells are low and they're anemic, that can cause the heart to race. I would always check thyroid too, because sometimes this is a manifestation of a thyroid problem. Those would be the tests I would check. And then I would do an EKG, which is an electrocardiogram. And that is 
a simple test that involves putting electrode stickers on the chest, the arms and the legs, and taking a snapshot, which you may have seen as like a little squiggly picture of the heart's rhythm. And that's a quick, inexpensive starting point. And then I would always listen very carefully to the person's heart and examine them for anything else that might be unusual, the thyroid, as I mentioned, uh, check their pulses, check their circulation. And depending on what I hear, say there might be a heart murmur or something concerning in the heart, I might do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. And depending on the story, I would often place a monitor and send them home with a heart monitor for 24, 48 hours to see if we can catch those palpitations when they happen. Great. That's really thorough. What are your tips for successfully keeping wearing the monitor? I've actually prescribed this a lot. I've never had to wear one uh, myself. And so what tips do you have for, you know, getting through those couple of days with that heart monitor on? So the heart monitor is tricky and there are several different types. Some of them are easier to wear than others. So the first thing is to pick the right monitor. So some of them have three stickers attached to wires, attached to something that looks like a cell phone. And that you wear as long as you feel you need to catch the rhythm. So if someone says it's happening every single night like clockwork as soon as I lay my head on the pillow, I only need to do it probably for 24, 48 hours because we'll catch it. But some people say, oh gosh, it happens sort of every once or twice a week. And Murphy's Law is in that person, if you put the monitor on for three days, you don't catch it, you take it off, then it starts to happen. So then I might have them wear it for a week. So the longer you wear the monitor, the more of a pain in the neck it is. The keys are to always ask for sensitive electrodes because the stickers, they're built to stick um, and they can irritate skin when the skin is sensitive. So we have sensitive ones. Change the position of those stickers at least every 24 hours, if not more. And typically when people take a shower, they take that off and they put a new one on. And then ask your doctor, is it okay to take it off? Say they never occur overnight and you're wearing it for three days. Could you take it off one of those nights or two of those nights to get a good night's sleep because it might be annoying? And depending on the situation, that might be okay. So those would be the important things to remember. Some of the monitors are simply like a giant band-aid and that's called a patch monitor and that just goes over the chest. Those are a lot easier for people to wear because there aren't the wires and the devices, but they often are much more strong adhesive because they're meant to stay on usually for seven days and some of those are really irritating to the skin. So pick the right monitor with your doctor, wear it as much as you can, but keep in mind that if you don't have it on all the time, that's probably okay and then wear it for as short a time as possible once you get the symptoms recorded. Can you wear it when you're exercising? Depends, yes. We encourage people to wear them when they're exercising, so probably not when you're swimming. Some of them are waterproof, most of them are not. Okay. But for walking on the treadmill, or going for a brisk walk, yes. And we want to see what happens to your heart rate when you exercise, so we encourage people to keep them on. Now, a lot of times when I worked as a a primary care physician, uh, there just seem to be scenarios in otherwise healthy women, possibly related to their lifestyle, such as caffeine intake or et cetera, that I would just say, I think these are benign and uh, let's try some lifestyle changes. Is that a good idea? Is it, is it a good idea in an otherwise healthy individual to start by just with the lifestyle and assume they're benign? Or you know, when do you cross the threshold into getting that halter monitor on? That's a great question. By the time patients come to me, typically a primary care doctor has already decided this is something that needs evaluation. So I almost always end up doing some kind of testing. But for you or for a primary care doctor or even for a patient who's sitting at home listening to this, it's usually totally fine to tweak your lifestyle and see if they get better because almost universally, these are not life-threatening. And if you feel okay when they happen, other than it, that weird sensation that something funky is going on in there, if you're not fainting, if you're not having chest pain, if you're not having trouble breathing, and if it's not making you super anxious, you could take a week or two and just try cutting back on caffeine, which is a really good point I hadn't mentioned. 
eliminate if there are any stimulating medicines you're on, like Suda said. Try relaxation and meditation. Try hydrating. And that's a completely reasonable approach. If you try those things and it's still bothersome, then it's worth at least go to your primary doctor, get someone to listen to your heart, examine your thyroid, and go from there. Great, great. So I wanted to go back because you mentioned pregnancy and uh, perimenopause, menopause. How do the hormone fluctuations, how do they interact with our heart and cause these palpitations? What is that relationship? So there's two, but the, the main one is that estrogen levels can affect the rhythm of the heart. And when estrogen levels drop, it can cause a rhythm problem called PVCs, which stands for premature, early, ventricular contraction. So normally when your heart beats, it beats by, I'm going to show you my heart model here. We're all born with a little pacemaker up in the upper right chamber. So there's four chambers in the heart, the right atrium and right ventricle, upper and lower. And then on the left, the left atrium and left ventricle, upper and lower. And normally there's a pacemaker that we're born with in the right atrium that tells the atria, the upper chambers to beat first, and then the lower chambers beat second. And there's a nice rhythmic sequential contraction, upper, lower, upper, lower. And that's felt as that lub-dub, lub-dub, if you listen to someone's heart, it, it beats in that sequence. When someone has a PVC or a premature ventricular contraction, that means there's an early beat that's coming from the lower chamber, coming from the ventricle. And so we call it premature because it comes sooner than expected. We call it ventricular because it's coming from that lower chamber contraction or squeezing. And so that can be felt as a bump, 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 and then a pause where the body compensates because there have been two beats in a row, and then you restart again. And when estrogen levels fluctuate, the ventricles are more likely to initiate those early beats. And so they can cause these PVCs, which are very common and happen virtually in all of us at some quiet background level. It can cause those beats to be much more common. So that is really common. And the second thing that can happen during pregnancy and perimenopause is just the stress levels that are normally kind of fluctuating in our body become much higher. So we have two nervous systems, the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, adrenaline, fast heart rate. And then we have parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, feed and breathe, and that's slow the heart rate down. And sometimes those two nervous systems get out of balance. And instead of being regulated, you have too much adrenaline and too much stress hormones. And that can cause the normal pacemaker to beat faster than it than it's used to beating. And that is felt just as a faster heart rate, kind of inappropriately fast. So sometimes it's PVCs due to estrogen fluctuations, and sometimes it's high adrenaline levels just due to stress or dehydration or stimulating things like caffeine. But those are the two most common things that I see in my practice. Wow, beautifully said. Does this mean that estrogen, either in birth control pills or estrogen in postmenopausal hormone therapy is contraindicated in your opinion with these benign premature ventricular contractions? No, not at all. So in fact, sometimes it's those rapid fluctuations that are the problem and studying them can get rid of the problem. So many women find that taking birth control pills can help reduce the premature beats. And similarly, hormone replacement therapy may reduce those premature beats. Yep. I, I sort of see the same thing and I, and I agree with you in that point. Is there a uh, worry that having benign palpitations it can increase your risk for other cardiovascular conditions? So here's an interesting thing. So I think of the heart kind of like a car. I'm not a mechanical person, but when you're driving your car down the road, you might have a faulty wiring of your headlight and the headlight might start to flicker. That's an electrical problem. PVCs are an electrical problem. That does not mean your engine's about to blow. It does not mean your tires are going flat. It's electrical. So people think, oh, I have a heart problem. I'm going to have a heart attack like my grandfather. 
Heart attacks are not related to PVCs. Heart attacks are caused by clogged arteries, angina and heart attacks that need stents and bypass. That's blocked arteries, atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, cholesterol, diabetes, smoking. Those things are blockages of the arteries that we think of as causing coronary artery disease. No relationship to PVCs, which are an electrical issue. So the only time that we worry about PVCs leading to a heart problem are when they're really, really frequent and common. So if someone has more than 15, 20, 25% of their heartbeat for months at a time being PVCs, that can actually tire the heart muscle out and the muscle can get weaker. So that's really rare. But that is one of the other reasons I sometimes do these monitors because sometimes people say it's happening all the time. It's like every other beat or it's every third beat for hours at a time. We want to quantify that. And if it's 5%, 10%, it feels like a lot. But it's not until you get to 20% or so that we actually see a problem. But I've, if it were, we treat it. Yeah. I love that metaphor because I do think it is anxiety provoking. And then I wonder what your thoughts are, but I think if anxiety or stress hormones are something that can increase the palpitations, the more anxious they make you, yeah. perhaps it's a vicious cycle. Do you see that? And how, oh my how God. Do you, <laughs> what do you say to patients? Because <clears throat> certainly, you know, as you know, women were very intuitive and inquisitive and curious and smart. And then we Google everything. And so when you first feel that first one, you know, can it trigger more? And how do you tell your patients what are the lifestyle things to do if it makes you anxious? It's such a great question and such an important question because the PVCs themselves will usually come in these little waves and then pass. But if the PVC triggers a vicious cycle of anxiety and stress and producing more adrenaline, more stress hormones, then that in itself can cause both problems, the racing heartbeat and more PVCs. Adrenaline causes more PVCs. And then it can really take off. And in fact, let's see, Friday, I had a patient who's a nurse who works in an operating room. And she is a patient who has called me with every one of her pregnancies because every one of her pregnancies, she gets PVCs. And they start to drive her crazy and she gets very anxious. And by the third pregnancy, she's calling me. She's like, I know what you're going to say. You're going to give me your spiel. I hear your voice in my head. They're benign. Don't worry about it. But I still need to hear it from you. So I tell her that and it gets better and it goes away. But every time she can't talk herself down, it accelerates and it becomes a problem. And I told her, listen, you, the PVCs are kind of a problem. But the biggest problem is that your anxiety is causing more of them and you can't break that cycle. She actually takes Valium when it happens, and that breaks the cycle. But hopefully we can break the cycle before you get to the point that you're having a full-blown panic attack, because I see that a lot. So what can you do? So I have patients who say to me, I repeat what you said to me, and I hear it in my ears. I, I look in the mirror and I say, I'm fine. I've had this for years. It goes away. It's not a big deal. My doctor says I'm fine. So they try that. So just kind of self-talk, visual imagery of being in a quiet, calm place, breathing exercises. So deep breathing can help activate the parasympathetic, calming nervous system. So four deep breaths, breathe in for four seconds, hold it, breathe out for four. Uh, laying down, having something to drink if you might be dehydrated, meaning water. Gatorade, something like that. Eat if you're hungry because low blood sugar can trigger adrenaline and make these things worse. Um, and then having something on hand to take if you do all those things and it's still bothering you. And sometimes that's a medicine like a beta blocker, which would be something like a penolol or metoprolol in a low dose that your doctor might give you. That works really well. Sometimes it might be magnesium or something called Calm, which is an herbal supplement you could get over the counter that has magnesium and some calming herbs in it. And sometimes if it's, if it's serious and someone might also have an anxiety disorder or have Valium or something like that for when they have a, like a problem that they can't break out of, that's a great option too. 
Great. So this is a great point that you talked me through, which is when to start medications. And it seems like then if it's something that is affecting your quality of life, it's something seemingly that you can't get good control of over at home, or if it's making you so anxious, you might get to a panic attack level. That's a good level for even though these are benign, that you might be a candidate for medications. Absolutely. So medicines we sometimes use in cardiology to save lives, and sometimes we use them to help symptoms. And this is a case where it might be useful to help symptoms. I'm not going to prescribe a beta blocker to save someone's life from PVCs because it's not life-threatening. It's not dangerous. But it can definitely impair your quality of life. So somebody might be driving and feel like it's they don't, it's so distracting to drive, or they're trying to take care of their children or do their job, and it's distracting and it's worrisome, then medications might really help kind of settle things back down to normal. Wonderful. So my last question for you is, do you think these are more common in women based on some of the causes or the etiology? Or would you say, you know, I see them in both. You just see women, Heather, so you're maybe a little bit biased, but I don't know what the data shows and I don't know what you think. So, you know, I only see the people who are bothered by this for the most part. So I think women, as a general rule, are a little more tuned into their bodies Mm -hmm. and a little more aware of things that are going on that are a little different than baseline. Um, I also have a lot of women who have said to me, I'm afraid I'm going to die and leave my children without a mother, which, again, is not a dangerous problem. But once you become a mother, a lot of women feel the stakes go up and they say, I'm not here because of me. I'm here because I just had a kid or, you know, I'm worried about my kid. So women perhaps are more likely to seek help for something that doesn't feel dangerous. It's not making them faint. It's not making them, you know, gasp for air, but they're worried that it's an indicator of something dangerous. So on the one hand, I think women are more likely to come in. On the other hand, I also think women are more likely to go through times of hormonal fluctuations where they definitely become more frequent. So that being said, the original, one of the original studies on PVCs was done on army recruits, on these 20 year old young men who wore Holter monitors for 24 hours and ran around. And over 50% of them had PVCs. A lot of them didn't feel them, but they had them. So long answer to a short question. I think they're probably a little more common in women, especially around certain periods of life. And I think women are more likely to seek medical attention. I think that's so interesting that some of us may, as you kind of mentioned a little bit ago, have these in the background, but sometimes we just don't notice them or et cetera. And other times we do. So thank you so much. I think this was a great, great, great conversation on an issue that I see so much in the clinic, something that really bothers women and that we could really kind of give in this nice little Cliff's Notes summary in this episode. So I also want to let you know for these for the listeners, if you are listening to this and you want to see her heart models, go ahead and I will put this up on my YouTube channel, which is Health by Heather Hirsch, and I'll link it below if you want to see us talking as well. And so we will put this episode out on both my podcast and also on YouTube. Well, Dr. Lee Lewis, anything else before we let you go? Gosh, no, but thank you for, for bringing this out to women who, who haven't felt the need or not yet needed to seek medical attention for this, because I think understanding why these happen and what it means and that it's benign will be really reassuring for people, because I don't actually think there's anyone who hasn't had these at some point in their lives, and maybe they don't have a doctor at that moment, or they thought it was they were too busy to seek medical attention. It's really important that people recognize, yes, Our heart beats 2 billion times in our lifetime. Once in a while, that beat is going to be a little different. And if it comes and it goes and it doesn't make you dizzy or faint or chest pain or shortness of breath, it's okay to ignore it. But do take it as a possible signal that you might be under a lot more stress or there might be something hormonal and tune into that. And then when in doubt, talk to your doctor. That's 
That's wonderful. So many good pieces of information in this episode. So thank you so much for enlightening us with your wisdom. Well, thank you guys again so much for listening to the podcast. Please feel free to leave us a star or review or a comment because that helps other women see this podcast in the algorithm and have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.